garance à tout le monde, n'est-ce pas Oui, on peut commencer. Très bien. OK. Good morning and uh, good afternoon to all of you from uh, UNESCO Paris. Uh, we are very happy to welcome you to this second edition of this series of regional exponent consultations against gender stereotypes with the aim to change mindsets and norms. Today, we're focusing on Asia and the Pacific. Uh, my name is Anna Maria Mailev, and I work for the Inclusion and Rights section at UNESCO. Uh, let me first remind you that English and French interpretation is available during this online meeting by clicking on the globe on your screen. Um, let me introduce you now to Mrs. Gabriela Ramos. She is our Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences, and she is going to deliver the opening remarks and also set the agenda. And she will be followed by our moderator and consultant, Mr. Tim Shand, who is the co-founder and director of Shand Clark Consulting and an expert on gender, masculinities, and harmful stereotype. Thank you. And I hope that you have a great webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ana Maria. And um, thank you all for joining us. As we saw, this is a, a global consultation that UNESCO is carrying forward. Great to have Tim with us, uh, sparing the efforts. Uh, but also great to have you all. Great to have Ashwin, Elsa, Elsa Marie, Natalie, and Annie. And uh, we're really looking forward to, to, to hearing from you because this is the kind of uh, um, setting in which we can really exchange views and trying to find answers to some of the problems uh, that we are perceiving as uh, the most important to tackle. Uh, problems that are not new uh, with the pandemic, but that have proven that uh, they are very resilient. <laughs> and no matter how much we try to advance uh, gender equality, it always seems uh, looks like uh, one step ahead and two step behind and then we, we need to join forces uh, with champions uh, like you. We need to look at uh, the benchmarks of the way things can work uh, and how to uh, tackle uh, these important issues. It's particularly the, the stereotyping, cultural norms, institutional settings um, that are so important uh, for us in terms of uh, tackling uh, inequality. Uh, this year, of course, it was last year, but then, uh, due to the pandemic, this year is going to be the uh, Generation Equality Forum. And, and in UNESCO, we're stepping up our efforts to see how much we can contribute with the mandate that we have in terms of uh, promoting peace, in terms of promoting peaceful societies, and in terms of uh, defending human rights. Um, and, and we cannot deny it. Uh, I'm sure that you as, uh, as experts in this field have seen how impressive uh, the reflection of the gender gaps that we have um, in normal times become so acute uh, when we face uh, the shock that we have faced during the last year. And when we see that uh, many of the angles that we have been trying to tackle, be it in the economic, the social, the health, the essential workers that are women, um, get exacerbated uh, when, when we are confronted with uh, such a, a, a difficult, difficult time. Uh, and therefore, it's no surprise that, that, that the impact of this crisis has been really um, uh, been felt much more uh, by women, um, although it's, it's global, of course, I would not minimize the, the suffering of everybody. Uh, but the reality is that because of the characteristics of the pandemic, uh, women have really bear the brunt of the of the of the impact uh, differently from 2008. Uh, we were just looking at the data released in the U.S. Uh, in terms of uh, labor impact uh, and the latest numbers, uh, and it's incredible that that of course many people lost their jobs, and this is something that we need to tackle. Uh, but there is one million more uh, female jobs that have been lost. Uh, the sectors that have been affected are uh, where women is overrepresented, uh, the entertainment, the uh, services, restoration, as I say, the essential workers, also the nurses, 90%, care work, 90%, childcare, 90%. So all these, all these uh, uh, sectors have really been um, uh, touched by women, and therefore we need to, we need to look for answers. 
But then, of course, the other pandemic, as the Secretary General uh, Guterres has uh, called the violence against women, uh, uh, which is the ultimate, ultimate uh, proof of how wrong uh, the, the relationship uh, between men and women can be, uh, because it's men's violence against women. And this has increased uh, in very steep way. And, and I would like to hear from, from all of you in terms of uh, not only the data, because the data is there and helps us focus the mind. A, a good killer fact focus more the mind than 20,000 pages. But, but uh, how do we deal with it? And how do we raise our voices to, to really ensure that this is, this is not the way we want to, we want to handle? And so um, let's uh, proceed with the, with, um, with the discussions. Let's see how we could uh, uh, advance a, a more um, equal world. Um, let me remind you some of the elements that we have about this important uh, region. In India, between March uh, and May 2020, uh, there were really uh, an increase in complaints of domestic violence uh, that were recorded um, than in previous 10 years. Maybe it's good that women are coming out to, to complain because that's another angle that, uh, that is not always present, but, but the, the, just the relationship is just uh, impressive. Naninda Das, the Indian actress and jury member of UNESCO Mandajit Sang Prize reflected that in her short movie, Talk to Her, uh, that reached uh, uh, 300,000 views, um, touch upon, upon this issue. In Nepal, domestic violence, uh, they tell me that increase of about 77% after the lockdown compared to the period before it. Uh, and nurses and activists in Sri Lanka urged the government to create more helplines for victims of domestic abuse during the lockdown. And Fiji's national domestic violence helpline recorded also a significant increase, uh, increase in calls in April, around uh, 550 calls compared to 57 in February and 187 in March. Uh, so yes, the stress is really being translated into, in this, into this kind of, of, uh, of outcomes. Uh, and in the beginning of the pandemic, there were 15 additional cases of violence against women worldwide for every additional three months of lockdown. Unlike harassment against women, uh, in UNESCO, we're also developing a recommendation on artificial intelligence, and it has a, a very strong content related to women. But again, harassment and uh, cyberbullying, targeting women uh, through through the internet is is an important uh, challenge to to address. And so this 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 is a structural the violence is a structural, and as I said, it's just the ultimate ultimate proof of how much we need to change the relationship. And that's why. We, we are moving forward with this. We know that rules and regulations matter. We know that legislating equality matters. And we commend many of the countries in, in, the, in, the, in UNESCO that have really advanced this agenda. But we know that all these regulations, all these legal uh, progress uh, will not deliver what we need if we don't change mindsets. And this is not new. It might all, almost uh, sound like a cliche, let's change mindset. Uh, but now we, we really have no excuse, have no excuse and we need to, to figure out how to advance it. And, and in UNESCO, uh, in, the, in the area that Ana Maria has been helping with, we are developing some groundbreaking projects that will need your help. Expanding for the Men for Gender Equality Initiative to the Master Classes Against Racism and Discrimination and the Intercultural Competencies Framework uh, to the recommendations on ethics of AI that I already uh, mentioned. And, and I'm so glad to tell you that we soon are going to launch the Observatory for Women in Sports. So all the angles that we can. This is my sector, of course, it's a social and human science sector, but as you know, we have also the women in science. We have the work that we're doing with girls in schools and the and the cultural uh, norms also. So, but the but the but the flagship related to mindset, the right flagship related to cultural uh, norms and uh, and uh, all these uh, intangible that is uh, nurturing the kind of outcomes that I have mentioned need to be tackled. And we need to hear from you 
to understand what are those elements that can help us advance a meaningful agenda where we can go back to our, our member states and tell them uh, this is what works. It doesn't, it's not enough to be worried about, about the figures and about the outcomes, but uh, we, we have to pave the way in, in a way that we can tackle it. So I'm, I'm re really looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, Tim, uh, over to you. We're very glad that you're helping is, us with it. And, um, and let's, uh, let's join forces. I'm very glad to, that you are uh, helping us with this very important task. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gabriella, for those really inspiring remarks and a real pleasure to join you and to um, facilitate this discussion today. As part of my work on, on and research on, on gender and, and gender norms over the last 20 years, I've done quite a lot of work in Asia and the Pacific. So it's such a wonderful pleasure to, to be part of this conversation today. I just want to pick up on one thing that um, Gabriella mentioned um, and then talk about the format for today. And then I'm going to introduce the really fantastic panel of, of speakers that we have for this conversation. Gabriella mentioned the, um, the new flagship program. UNESCO has had a long-term um, strategic priority on gender equality. And as part of that strategic priority, the organization is launching this new initiative of which this conversation today is, is part of helping the organization and helping all of us to, to shape um, the work and to address the challenge that Gabriella mentioned, particularly around shifting mindsets. And so this is part of a, of a six regional consultations that you may be um, aware of, and we will take this work forward, both in terms of shaping um, a research report, a network of male role models, and a global advocacy campaign. And stay tuned, we'd love to engage you in that, but thank you for being part of the journey with us. So the format um, for this conversation today, um, I'll begin with an interactive conversation with the, the panel, who I'll introduce, and as I, as I mentioned, and that will last for about 30 to 40 minutes, and that will then open up for um, question and answer. We have around 100 people already joining as attendees, which is fantastic. Please do use the, um, the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to pose your questions, and um, please also use the chat box. We want this session to be um, as interactive as possible. So um, while we're talking with the panel, please use the chat box um, to share your thoughts um, on what's been discussed, your thoughts on what some of the solutions might be. And then after the um, panel discussion, we'll then, um, and the question and answer, we'll then um, have a uh, a conversation around recommendations and I'll go back to the panel um, to ask for their thoughts around recommendations and I'll also encourage all of you listening in to pose your recommendations on the chat box and I'm delighted that we will then be able to close um, with remarks um, from Ashwar Ya Segal, the Associate Program Coordinator in UNESCO's office in New Delhi um, and then I'll say a, a couple of final um, comments. So let's get started and let me introduce the fantastic group um, that we are really thrilled and grateful um, have taken time out to join us. And I think we'll, we'll um, have a really fruitful conversation. Um, Ashwin Chandreka is the host of the new Manifesto podcast in India and Vice President Strategy at the Global Alliance for Mass Entrepreneurship, responsible for driving strategy, conceptual thinking, ideation and research. He applies his background as a senior consultant at Dalberg to his passion for social justice and women and girls empowerment. Elsa Marie de Silva is founder and CEO of Red Dot Foundation India and president of Red Dot Foundation Global. Global. Elsa Marie is listed as one of the BBC Hindi's 100 women and has won several awards including the Women Transforming India Award, and the Global Leadership Award by Vital Voices. She has written and spoken widely, nationally and internationally. Kyoko Kusagabe is Professor of Gender and Development Studies at the Asian Institute of Technology in Thailand. She has over 20 years experience researching and teaching gender and development in Asia, as well as working with NGOs and government on gender mainstreaming. Nani Zumanlari 
is president of the Asia South Pacific Association for Basic and Adult Education and founder of PICA in Indonesia, which focuses on empowering female heads of households who are the poorest of the poor. She is a gender development specialist, educator, and activist with over 33 years experience eradicating poverty and addressing discrimination. Natalie Laurez Verceles is director of the Center for Women's and Gender Studies at the University of the Philippines. She is also a professor at the Department of Women and Development Studies in the College of Social Work and Community Development, UP Diliman. She has published and presented numerous papers on feminist economics. Sandy Morrison is Assistant Dean Academic for the University of Waikato Faculty of Maori and Indigenous, Indigenous Studies in New Zealand. Sandy self-describes as tribally grounded, globally informed, and tested against the everyday realities in which whanau exist. Her research interests include treaties, adult education, and indigenous, indigenous development. So welcome, what a fantastic panel. Um, let me remind the speakers that as we begin this conversation, if you could please keep your remarks to no more than three minutes each. Um, Ashwin, could I begin with you? Um, particularly, I, I know of your, of your work through the, the new Manifesto podcast, which seeks to challenge gender binaries and, and particular definitions of manhood um, issues that I have worked on um, for some time. Could I begin with asking you the question, um, given your work, what has that highlighted to you as the main issues and stereotypes today and the Asia and the Pacific that we need to be aware of as part of this conversation? Well, I think, um, thanks for, I mean, thanks to UNESCO for bringing me on this panel, first of all, and excellent to be here. Uh, I think, Tim, to your question, uh, some of these stereotypes are age old. Uh, they are not stereotypes that are new or uh, new to the 21st century. I think those binaries around uh, the protector provider uh, stereotype that still exists, uh, that still makes a lot of uh, parents make decisions around who, which child they're going to invest in a lot more. Uh, of course, this differs by socioeconomic class, this, this, uh, this differs by urban rural, but we still see in India, uh, you know, despite greater education uh, among, among women, uh, labor force participation is uh, reducing, it's not increasing. Uh, and so it, I think those, those stereotypes of um, ma a man being a provider and protector, what manhood means, what a real man means, continues to dominate how we think about uh, gender roles. Uh, it, we, we are by, by nature uh, aggressive. Uh, I think that's something I hear quite a bit from my own friends who are uh, you know, supposed to be educated in, in some of India's most elite edu uh, institutions. Uh, as I think uh, has been discussed before, this pandemic has resulted in um, a spike in intimate partner violence. And I've been part of those conversations with, uh, you know, peers and a lot of the framing of why something has happened, why has violence been uh, perpetrated is, so is are things that we've already heard before men talk about, which is I get angry uh, and I can't control my anger. And I think those just that expectation of or that uh, fundamental definition of what a man means, uh, what aggression means, and how that is part of and parcel of who you are as a man uh, continues to persist. Great, thank you very much, Ashwin. Um, Elsa Marie, can I bring you in here? Um, Ashwin just started talking about intimate partner violence. Um, Gabriella, um, at the beginning of the, the conversation, talked about the, the other pandemic of violence against women. I know that you've done a lot of work on, on gender-based violence, Elsa Marie. Um, would love your thoughts on this question of stereotypes and the challenges that we face um, in Asia and the Pacific. Thanks, Tim. This is a very interesting discussion and um... It's sad that it took a pandemic to expose this other shadow pandemic as it is now being called. Uh, one of the reasons in my view is that there is a silence that surrounds this issue. It is a taboo topic that often puts the onus on the victim or the survivor to stay silent and also to prove that this crime that has been committed against her is in fact a crime. Um, and that, to me, is the real injustice. 
So, you know, when we talk about uh, speaking to men and boys about it, it's just a fraction of the population that we are talking about. My organization, for example, uh, has an app called Safe City where we encourage people to anonymously share their stories of uh, sexual and gender-based violence. And we do a lot of workshops in schools, colleges, communities, and even corporate houses. And most often, the women you know, don't want to admit that they have experienced something. In fact, they cannot even recognize that what has happened to them is a crime because there is no vocabulary for it. For example, we call it Eve teasing. And the very fact that we call it Eve teasing in India puts, makes it very trivial. It's very normalized. It's part of your daily routine. So chin up, bear it, don't make a complaint. It's a waste of time. And we get excited and want to do something when there's a rape or a gang rape. Not just a rape, a rape that is coupled with murder, a rape that is so um, gruesome that it, um, it shocks everyone out of their complacency. And one of the things that we want to do is to make this problem more visible by an encouraging anonymous reporting, simply because otherwise you don't have the true numbers. What reaches the police station or what reaches a corporate formal reporting system is again, highly, highly underreported. And unless we get the true data, we won't be able to pinpoint what are the true factors that cause this and how can we solve them? Of course, it all stems from patriarchy and I'm sure we are going to unpack this during this conversation, but I wanted to place on record that we don't really have the true numbers to talk about it. Thank you, Elsa, Marie. And I think it would be great to, to return to the question of patriarchy and let's certainly try and unpack that. That's a really important often elephant in the room that we don't talk sufficiently enough um, Nani, can I turn to to you next? Um, I mean, reflecting on this conversation, and you know, I, a lot of your work has, in particular, been focused on the the kind of the the, the poorest women and and um, you know, people, the poorest of the poor. And um, how do you see this question of the the what are the, the greatest stereotypes and and challenges that we face right now in Asia and the Pacific? And any reflections that you have also on how COVID has in, impacted negatively on, on those in your work would be would be appreciated. Nani, I think you're on mute. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to this conversation. I'm echoing um, I think uh, from the uh, from Elsa and Ashwin on the issue, but I would like to highlight one particular things related with the, the job or, or work that women uh, how a stereotyping of women uh, make the job limitation for women. So women usually have very low type of a pain in job and also responsible for uh, unpaid, un unpaid care work, which uh, during, during COVID where where uh, economic, our economy going to recessions, the first the first group that uh, be let off are women. So mostly women lost their job and, and because majority of poor women working on informal sectors, this is also a stereotyping of women. They work in uh, informal sector on the street where it's involved a lot of interaction. When the COVID happened and there are a lot of limitations, we, for example, in Indonesia, the government have this regulation of limitation of social interactions. They, they have to lose or lose or their, their job, right? Because, because nothing can be done during the, the pandemic. At the, in the meantime, the uh, burden of and responsibility of their homework as, as unpaid care work at home is increased because everybody at home, so women have to be responsible for maintaining their um, family meals while also helping their children in education who is now stay, uh, studying at home. So this, this create multiple, multiple burdens for poor women particularly. And, and in some cases, the, the economic collapse also have pushed the, some of men going back home 
uh, because they're maybe when they migrate and now they, they have no more job in their uh, other places, then they come back home without nothing. So we have also a lot of cases documented where uh, children get raped by their own father, the girl child by their own father, because the mother has to be busy uh, looking for earning for the family and the children's at home with the parent, with the fathers and the father raped the children. So this cycle actually uh, emerged because of all these uh, uh, what you call stereotyping and also uh, the way of thinking, the patriarchal way of thinking, the patriarchal uh, mindset where men are um, the, the breadwinners, but when they lost their job and they stay at home, they get uh, st stressful, whereas women actually stressful, but women have to you know as they not naturally try to save their family and they still working outside to find earnings. So I think that's one particular thing that I would like to highlight in this particular conversation. Great, thank you. I think you've brought in a really important issue there about unpaid care and 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 kind of the stereotype about around kind of being the breadwinner, which would I think is really important to further reflect on. Um, Natalie, can I turn to you next on this question? Um, would appreciate your thoughts. One of the things that has really interested me and in, in your work is particularly your focus on gender, sexual orientation, identity, and, and expression, but you may want to bring that aspect in or you, you may want to um, speak more broadly on anything that you feel is important on this topic. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Tim, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, UNESCO. It's a pleasure to join this panel. Well, I'd probably like to focus on very obstinate stereotypes, and I heard this already from the other panelists. The first is man as breadwinner and woman as homemaker, or as principally responsible for the reproductive and care work that sustains families, which manifests in the unequal gender division of labor. So in the Philippines, since 1998, there has been a gap of 26 to 32 percentage points in the labor force participation rates of women and men. So in the 2019 labor force, labor force survey, women's LFPR was 47.6%, meaning only 47.6% of all women aged 15 and above were in the labor force. So for women who also do productive and community management work, the unequal gender division of labor also results in multiple burdens and time poverty. And as already mentioned, labor market discrimination and employment segregation result in women being concentrated in the informal economy. And we know that workers in the informal economy are not covered or if they are, or they are insufficiently covered by formal arrangements. They have you know, no income security, lower earning capacity, have little or little to or no access to labor and social protections, et cetera. No, they have also lack of time to participate in sectoral organizing. But there's one stereotype that I'd like um, to highlight in this discussion because just last week, our president, that's Rodrigo Duterte, reiterated publicly that women are unfit to become political leaders because they are emotional. So the assumption is if you're emotional, you'd, as a consequence, be weak. Um, and this, I think, is important to mention because it's reflected in the political representation in the country. So there, the, we've had a downgrade in our ranking in the Global Gender Gap Report from 8 to 16. And this is due to the lower female representation in the cabinet, which declined from 25% to 10% between 2017 and 2019. And female representation in our Congress also fell slightly to 28% in the beginning of this year. So women really continue to face really huge obstacles in running for elected positions, which has implications in terms of women's issues being carried into the legislative arena. And there are social cultural barriers because leadership standards favor masculine traits such as strength, being authoritative and decisive. And you know, women officials also face a macho and vicious culture of politics that you know, turn them off in addition to the care work in households that deter them from entering the political arena. So, and we still have the men as dominant, women as subordinate discourse, which manifests very disturbingly in the persistence of violence against women, rape culture, sexism, misogyny, and also the occurrence of the online sexual abuse and exploitation of children. So these are really alarmingly 
persistent problems. And I know that this is um, generalized to countries you know, beyond the Philippines. So I think we should be really concerned about how to break these very harmful stereotypes. Thank you, Natalie. Um, so I'll move now to, to Sandy. And I think what's interesting is you've just talked about leadership and you know, Sandy is in a country led by a, a female leader who I think has been lauded somewhat globally for her response to, to, the, to the virus. And I sit in a country with a male, very masculine leader who has done really badly on the response. So I, with Sandy, you, you may want to, to talk, um, you know, I, I know that you've done a lot of thinking and work around historical discourses and um, you know, social and cultural meanings and power, but if you also have any thoughts on this question of leadership, which um, Natalie has just brought up to the fore, I think it's really important as we think about stereotypes. So we'd appreciate your reflection, Sandy. Sure. Well, good evening, friends and colleagues and everybody listening in. And I certainly had highlighted leadership um, as a response to this first question. And hearing you, Natalie, I saw Duterte's response as well and kind of did the oh my gosh um, response, just another another weakening of women coming out of a global political leader. And I certainly think that global leadership has a role to play as to whether they reinforce or combat some of those stereotypes. And I guess that's where we've been fortunate in terms of having Jacinda Ardern, a younger woman as well, um, be our leader through very traumatic times, one being the COVID-19 response, the one before that was what we remember um, with a terrorist shooting down and aiming specifically for our Muslim community in Christchurch. And um, there was one other catastrophe, sorry, it was, I seem to have um, forgotten it. And what we've seen is a very different style of leadership that has certainly had a profound impact on the way that we are handling the pandemic at the moment. And under her leadership, we also have a Minister of Women's um, Affairs as well, who has, we've had that ministry anyway, but that has really put gender to the fore and keeps it at the fore. However, in saying that, and in, in unpacking what we're doing in New Zealand, there's still some things that we're not meeting. And coming from a tribal background and coming from the indigenous people, the further we unpack what are some of the issues, the inequities we note are really exacerbated and their impact on indigenous women, Māori women here in New Zealand. Um, New Zealand is also a gateway to the Pacific nations. And as a result of that, we have a responsibility in our relationships with the Pacific. And some of the things that our Pacific women and Pacific nations are highlighting are these issues of violence that, um, you know, I can certainly attest to similar experiences, but located in the Pacific uh, as well that are impacting. Another thing, and I'm, I'm sure that you're really familiar with this, is when you take men out of the labour force in order to serve the interests of New Zealand and Australia, because that's what happens here, and you have another catastrophe like cyclones, um, where, and then the borders are closed, so the men working in New Zealand and Australia who are here for seasonal work can't actually get home to help. And so what we have is like, for example, in the small nation of Tunga, one third of men between 18 to 25 are out of the country. And so given that the Pacific countries close the borders, then the burden on women to also rise from disaster and repair from disaster is even hindered more, let alone facing these issues that COVID has presented as well. So there's a whole lot of multi-complex factors at work, I think, that, um, that 
need unpacking in terms of finding resolution. So I guess I could just leave those key points here for that moment, Tim. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandy, and thank you. Let me remind everybody who's listening to please participate, please. And um, we've had um, a, a couple of questions now, thank you. Please use the Q&A box and please um, provide comments on, on what you're hearing in the chat box. And I see there's been quite a few people commenting already. So thank you, thank you all um, very much. I I'd like to come back to this question. It seemed to me a running thread through a lot of what you've all mentioned perhaps could be encapsulated in this, this question of, of patriarchy that you mentioned, Elsa Marie. I mean, I think we talked about the stereotype around the workplace um, and, the, and the fact that the kind of accepted roles in, in public and private, which exists globally, how that has negatively impacted on women as a result of women's childcare responsibilities um, being disproportionately um, responsible um, globally but you know, particularly in, in, in the, you're talking about Asia and the, and the Pacific. Um, and then I, I think leadership and how we understand structural barriers to, to power and, um, and involvement. And um, so I'd maybe come back to you, Elsa Marie, um, and it would be um, good also to um, begin thinking about some emerging solutions that we're aware of in Asia and the Pacific, but your thoughts um, on question of how do we unpack patriarchy and and what's the kind of next steps and how it how it manifests itself and then if others would like to come in um, on this question um, would be great to get your views so well I think the first step to understanding patriarchy is to confront our own implicit and unconscious bias I don't think in our education system we even have curricula for it so at a very early age, we need to start having these conversations and help people understand and become more gender sensitive. And here in this discussion, we are talking about women and men. We are not even talking about the third gender or the various other, you know, different uh, combinations of the LGBTQI uh, family. So we have to understand we have to have these conversations. We have to create spaces for safe dialogue. And then we have to examine whether we are walking our talk. So for example, you take any statistic. Uh, the, you know, when we talk about patriarchy, that, that means there's a clear preference for a male or a male child, right? Over a female child. And you look at the femicide rates in India. Um, two states, according to our own government's reporting to on SDG 5 states that, uh, you know, the ratio is pathetic. And two of our states, Rajasthan and Andhra Pradesh, have 806 girl ch children born for every thousand male uh, children born. And in August 2019, one of the states in North India issued a red alert. To me, a red alert is issued when there's an earthquake, a cyclone, or some kind of disaster. But this was issued because in the three months uh, prior to the red alert, not a single girl child was born amongst the 230 or 30 odd births in 136 villages. And that was a cause of concern. That is, you know, from the time you're born. And in India, we have a law that protects an unborn child, as in a mother cannot, uh, a parent cannot find out the, uh, it's illegal to find out the sex of your child. Yet, you know, they're finding innovative ways to kill the girl child. So there are missing girls. And then, of course, at every stage of her life, you see so many other forms of abuse and discrimination, um, you know, and it translates into whether you see women in power or not. So when you come to leadership positions, who would you prefer? And in the chat section, we already have somebody saying that, you know, you would give it to the most um, qualified person. And in the absence of there not being a clear preference, he would still pick a man. Why would you do that? Why would you still go ahead and do that? And that really needs to be examined because that's what's happening. Today, we are talking about gender and we have two men on this panel. Uh, we have more women. But if you look at any other panel, you will see a manner. 
why do we prefer men to be experts and authority figures on any topic? Aren't there women? I spent 20 years in aviation and I think there are only two women CEOs amongst 100 aviation companies. And there are just less than 6% women pilots, even though one of the most famous pilots is Amelia Earhart, you know? So it's not that the women aren't there. We just take the lazy way out of not putting them in the forefront, not giving them the promotion, not putting them on a panel. And so if you can't see her, you cannot be her. So we need a lot of education right from an early age. We need safe spaces to discuss this very complex issue without feeling offended that somebody has challenged you on it. We need uh, you know, ways to safely report these crimes because they are crimes. And in my country, in India, we have a law for everything, but it's the implementation and execution of this law that is pathetic. And the last is these services should be made essential. During COVID-19, domestic violence services were not accessible to women, even though in the opening remarks, we heard that within the first two weeks, uh, the number was more than doubled than ever before. And yet women couldn't access services. And I, my organization filed a public interest litigation in the Supreme Court and it took forever to come up for hearing. That's just, that just shows you how important they see this issue. And COVID-19 is one kind of disaster. We are gonna live through life with many kinds of disasters. So I want to push for domestic violence services or any kind of services to address violence against women to be listed as essential. Great, thank you very much. Um, Ashwin, can I come to you and then I'm gonna bring in the other panelists as well. Um, so I, I think this question of, and you've done a lot of, com you've had a, had a lot of conversations talking about manhood. Um, you know, so this question of both kind of men are, are, are dominant in positions of authority and leadership and, and often women are invisible as Elsa Maria has said, but also, we, we do need to speak to men. We, we you know, men are also, um, as, a, as a result of our patriarchal world, are, are in many ways um, expressing, you know, versions of that in their, in their daily lives. How, what's your ex kind of experience and thoughts around this question of how do, we, how do we speak to, engage, talk to men to try and shift some of these gender stereotypes? Should we? Has, has your experience been that maybe um, that's not particularly helpful? Love your thoughts. Well, I mean, it's absolutely essential that we do, uh, but it's proven to be incredibly hard. And it's absolutely essential that we do is because, well, men dominate uh, positions of power today. And I think uh, if we want to make decisions that involve a restructuring of how the labor force, labor force looks like, if we want uh, political decisions to be made uh, that are more gender transformative uh, and manifest in that way in society, we need to engage men. Uh, but it's been an incredibly hard conversation to have, Tim. And as everyone on this uh, table can imagine, panel can imagine, uh, men have, uh, unfortunately, an entrenched interest in uh, patriarchy operating the way it does. Uh, they, there, is, there is privilege there, and that inaction will reproduce inequalities as it, as it does. And I think there's a very small example to uh, prove that. And I think a recent colleague was talking about, or a, a friend was talking about how in her organization, uh, they were trying to look for more women leaders at the top um, and, you know, put out an application out there, received a ratio of about kind of 38 male applicants and about two women applicants. And I think the response from uh, the leadership at that point was, hey, this is kind of, this is the market dynamic that we're dealing with. And this is how we need we, we as a small firm can't really do anything about it. So really inaction will reproduce inequality because that's the system we operate in uh, and men have that privilege. And I think we need many, many more men to be able to take that step and say, no, hey, let's, let's look beyond this applicant pool. Let's see what we're doing wrong in the processes we have uh, when we have a job description put out there. Let's look at a broader pool on LinkedIn and find those uh, as Elsa was talking about, find those kind of five, 10 women who are part of this industry, who are uh, experts in their field and try to get them on, on board. So I think that just being able to do that is an important step. And I think as, as men who are entrenched, who are benefiting from the system, we're unlikely to do it. Um, I think in terms of what would help, 
um, and this is not I, this is not a point solution. It has to be uh, part of everything that men participate in. We need an ecosystem of information that is uh, inclusive, that talks about uh, gender equality in the right ways, that intersects in their life at the right time. Uh, I'm in my podcast uh, targeting men between the ages of 18 and 35 and important conversations around dating, uh, around parenting uh, become ex especially prescient now and being able to infuse that with the right kind of language, the right kind of principles and surround them with that information on their Instagram, uh, amongst colleagues, uh, in school. That's that's the problem. That's the size of the problem we're dealing with. The, the information about patriarchy comes from everywhere. Uh, I think there has to be a reverse flow that comes from everywhere, everywhere as well. Uh, and so that that's the kind of uh, collaborative network of information we need to build around men. Great, thanks. Um, Koyoku, could I bring you in here? Would uh, appreciate your thoughts um, on the on the conversation and um, on and on solutions um, as we think about gender stereotypes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to be part of this event. Uh, I think as Ashwin was saying, uh, many of the things that we are now seeing as um, the gender inequality uh, phenomenon is very much uh, there even before COVID. But then, then with COVID, we have we are seeing it much more vividly. So uh, what we are now seeing is that uh, there are women are much more affected by this. Like for example, in Japan, there are like eight, uh, five more times uh, increase in suicide uh, among women than compared to men or like women's unemployment is more than double that of men. So it's the, the, the whole impact has been more on women. And then as Nani was saying, I mean, formal sector, government workers, I and mean, these are the people who are affected the most and then uh, uh, affected first by this economic downturn. So that's one thing that uh, I really concur with every, what everybody is saying that, that this pandemic is really affecting women much more than, 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 than men. Another issue that I want to highlight is about the access to services. Uh, the gender stereotype and discrimination do uh, create discrimination among people to access uh, services. For example, sex workers. Sex workers are having more difficulty going to the government offices and then uh, receiving the, the support uh, because they don't get treated very nicely. Or like LGBT, they have, uh, LGBT people also do have difficulty going to a uh, government office to, to get the support again because they get they don't get treated very well. So uh, uh, there is this, okay, is this open to everybody, but then, then uh, the way that how they get the service is very different. And then that also creates discrimination in terms of access to services. Another thing that I wanted to also highlight here is the, the issue of care workers. Care, we all know that care workers are paid very low. And then with all this, uh, during the COVID-19, uh, everybody hailed as heroine and heroes of all these care workers. However, the payment or the working condition of care works did not improve. And so, so what is this, all this uh, uh, lip service of uh, hailing, uh, appreciating care workers when we, there is no uh, a real kind of a support or improvement in the care work? So this is one way you think that we really do need to advocate for. Also, another thing that has been very silent is about the issue of elderly women. Uh, the, the poverty rate on elderly women is very high in many countries, even in Japan is very high, uh, in, Th in Thailand it's also very high, uh, more than half of the single elderly women in Japan are under poverty line, so uh, the, uh, and then this, uh, this pandemic has also been very silent to this, guy, uh, this group of elderly women as well, so uh, uh, elderly women living alone are a uh, 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 very silent uh, group of people who, uh, who have been neglected in many of these discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Kyoto. That's really helpful. Could I just come back to you with a with a with a follow up? One of the things I know that you've you've written about is kind of around the workplace in general, and um, you know, was also mentioned um, earlier in the conversation around how, in particular, you know, by by Gabriella, how COVID has really impacted on women, as you mentioned, particularly because so many of the the, the jobs that women do are are, are at the front line. Thinking about solutions, how, you know, it seems to me 
on the question of stereotypes. How, and I think it reflects a little bit of this conversation around some roles being seen as weak and other roles being seen as masculine and male and strong, which I know is very much a thing, you know, in, in Japan. How, how do we, how, how could we reimagine kind of working roles between men and women? What, what would it take? What would be the, the solution? What's, you know, what do we have to change in terms of the stereotypes of, of, of what's work and what's unpaid and what's paid? I think there are two, two issues here. One is about care workers, because care workers have been very, very paid le very little. For example, like care workers going to homes and visit home visit care workers, their pay is very low. And then the government is not even recognizing them as care workers or essential workers and not really including them in their, their aid packages. So so the recognition for care workers is very low, and this needs to be really uh, be reviewed because now everybody talks about how it's these essential workers that these people are very important. And then if they are very important, their pay have to increase, improve. Their working condition have to improve. So this is a good opportunity for us that we now know that it's very important. So uh, the whole concept uh, of the uh, care work, uh, care work, and care workers as a profession have to be improved. So that's one thing. The other thing is about uh, the, the, the career development, because uh, many of these uh, women dominated uh, occupations are not considered as career. They do not have the steps that they can go up so that they'll be able to improve their income. It's always like in the middle minimum wage kind of a situation. So again, reconceptualizing these occupations so that uh, we will have skills and upgrading and then and they can see themselves as do, building a career is also a very important thing that we need to advocate for. Great, fantastic. Um, Sandy, Natalie, Nani, would either of you like to come in on this question of solutions and um, what you've heard? Sandy, go ahead. Sure. Uh, so just some brief responses as well as affirming what I've heard and, and addressing this critical issue of patriarchy, it's just a whole lot of responses everywhere, right, that are needed. Um, quick responses, long term, middle term, we need them all. I think one, a couple of the things that we've been doing here in New Zealand is using sports stars who people idolise and revere to give messages on stopping violence, on seeking help and um, that's been effective, I think, because they're revered amongst their, their male, male colleagues. I also think that supporting these NGOs who are doing the work on the ground is really important. They understand what some of the issues are. They're working with them every day. Some extra funding that governments can give to them to help them, uh, to help the NGOs stay on the ground because I'm aware that um, COVID has probably reduced the amount of funding that NGO, NGOs can do and we're seeking more support and demanding a lot more from NGOs. So just really want to highlight um, the very valuable work and solutions that they find to, to try and make lives a lot better, particularly in terms of accessing services. So those are just a couple of inputs I'd like to make. Great, thank Can you. I? Yes, please go ahead, Nan. Yes, I think I think um, this is the momentous actually. If we want to talk, we want to talk about uh, how how can we change all this patriarchy in our life because of COVID that everyone now uh, are at home, right? So the the basic things of care care un, unpaid care work usually burden to women, so now can be shared can be shared in the family all with the children with um, men and, and women and on and every every single person in the family and and the, the challenge is and how to you know how to what you call it, to educate create and code and quote a family to reach out to family of this this kind of situation actually to transform the, the type the power relation in the family because 
the division of labor, we cannot avoid division of labor in, in our context, particularly in Southeast Asia, for example, so where the division of labor is very strong. But now with this opportunity, actually it can be reversed and can be also uh, how to develop um, a family as family. So it, it needs the whole, the whole family members, the whole people to be part of this process of change. Otherwise, then, uh, for example, women's right movement have been maybe what decades, yeah. What, but the 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 issues, the inequality, gender equality, and uh, gender inequality, and stereotyping, violence against women are still there because I think one thing, one particular thing that we are not so strong enough is starting from the early age. How can we? Um, uh, transform the value system from the very beginning of the children's. How can we we develop our kids with the new norm, the new the new value system? Which actually, and this is the responsibility of responsibility of parents, men and women in in the family and adult as well in the community. How can we create this value? So in order to so I think there are three three at least three arena. First of course the the value system with this paradigm uh, mindset system with through education from home, school, and the community. And the second is it is also very important to also work on the the visible one through the law uh, regulations and enforcement of the regulation uh, uh, in the workplace in the social services to really look at uh, uh, this uh, division of labor as not based binary gender based uh, decision, but also really based on different different dimensions, including capacities, opportunities, and also uh, the, the, the live reality of both uh, men, women, and other genders in our society. Tim, may I jump in just Please very do, quickly? Yeah. Yes. Well, what I'd like, since there's not much time, I'd just like to talk about an initiative that we are doing at the center, because one of our major projects is called the Angat Bayi, that translates to Uplift Women, Women's Political Empowerment Fellowship Program, which is in partnership, since we're talking about synergies, I mean, that was also an interest in the questions that were forwarded to us. So that's in partnership with the Embassy of Canada. We have a Canada Fund for Local Initiatives and also the Office of the Vice President of the Philippines, who, as you know, is a woman, that's Lenny Robredo. So our fellows are comprised of incumbent women elected officials. So they're provincial board members, city and municipal mayors, vice mayors, and councillors. So the program promotes feminist leadership and contributes directly to the enhancement of their skills and capacities um, of women politicians from across the country. So through the program, we not only break the stereotype that women cannot be effective leaders, we also elevate the traits that are considered feminine, care, compassion, empathy, and show that these can actually enhance leadership because you know, it's not just harmful stereotypes that we, are, we should be concerned about, but also everything that is feminine, that can be devalued. So what is culturally coded as feminine is, very easily devalued and what is culturally coded as masculine is valorized. So what we try to do is really to um, uphold, you know, or uplift how people see what is considered feminine. Fantastic. Thank you, Owen. I think that's a really great um, place for us to, to pause. Um, we've had a number of excellent questions. Thank you. We won't be able to get through everything. Please do keep the the questions coming. Um, it's a really rich um, and fruitful conversation. Just a reminder to everybody, and we've now got over 100 people online, that uh, UNESCO, we will take everything away from the conversation and from the chat box, and we'll use it as part of um, moving forward in relation to the, this new initiative. So if we don't get to your comment, um, we will still use your input. So thank you. And I'd like to pick up and come back to the panel, whoever would, would like to respond um, on these questions, kind of four particular issues that um, have been raised. I think one of them, and, and it touches on, I think it, to some extent what you just said, Natalie, uh, around the, the kind of the, the question of actually, there is much to be gained from um, femininity and, and, and those traits that we necessarily um, see as, uh, we sometimes see as, as, as weak. Um, and, and it's really a question around 
do stereotypes manifest themselves differently for for men and for women? And um, you know, is it, for example, are women changing perhaps in terms of their greater access to the workplace, but men are are, are not? And so, your thoughts on kind of how stereotypes are maybe different for for men and for women. Um, the the second question um, is one about the media and the role of the media and what the, and how we can challenge or or engage and support the media what role it plays in, in stereotypes. The third question is about role models and how do we engage role models? What uh, role do they play in, in this initiative? And then the final question is about parents. We've had a number of comments about parents. We already talked, Elsa Marie, about um, the kind of the preference for the boy child. And there's been a comment on kind of what role do parents play and how do we engage with parents? So. Those four questions, whoever would like to respond, please don't feel you need to respond to all of them. Um, um, who would like to start in responding? I can start. Great. Go so, ahead. you know, when we talk about patriarchy, it's not only men who, you know, subscribe to that mindset. Women do too. And women are mothers raising sons. That's why I think it's very important for all of us to you know, be educated about gender, gender stereotypes, harmful practices, healthy relationships at an early age, but also for adults. So that, uh, and this has to be done. I know people don't like talking about this, but if we want to push the agenda and make that change happen, it has to be everywhere. Um, so, you know, you can circulate videos, but also insist your member states introduce this curriculum at an early age in schools. There's also low hanging fruit. Uh, like if UNESCO is supporting any panels this year, make sure that there's equal representation because that's one way to, sh to see her, you know, and to get comfortable with the idea that women can also have expert opinions, not only on panels that regard women's issues and gender. And the last one, I love the idea of using cultural icons, whether they are sports stars or musicians or film stars, but please put them through a gender sensitivity course before you make them an icon because, you know, they shouldn't be your ambassador and then go and uh, beat up their partner and, uh, you know, undo all the hard work. I saw a recent uh, discussion amongst cricketers on menstruation. And it was really a vulnerable conversation where many of them did not even know what a period is. They didn't know about sanitary napkins, but I felt that conversation would have such a huge impact on, on, on the millions of fans who are mainly men in being able to talk about it. And even the women fans would say, oh my God, a man is talking about menstruation. So it shouldn't, it's not a taboo topic anymore. So I think creating these spaces for vulnerable conversations through your role models is going to be great. Thanks. Thank you. Who would like to come in next? I can, I can say something. Thanks, Kyo. Yeah. Um, I think I think I, I want to also uh, build on what Elsa just uh, said. Uh, I mean, doing something differently or saying something differently is something that uh, is a role model already. It's not that somebody have grand have to be a role model. I mean that, like for example, like uh, a child doing childcare in a different way. Yeah, the the company. The, because the child care have to be a social and corporate responsibility that have to be done. So, and then that have to be a norm that child care is a responsibility of the society and the corporates who hire these workers. So, uh, so, so, that, so, so doing child care in a different way, uh, uh, talking about menstruation in a different way. Yeah, so it's, it's something that is very important that uh, we have to, to promote. Thank you. Nani, would you like to come in? Yeah. Yes. Um, I think one of we we have been doing so far and develop when we started our movement called Women Headed Family in Indonesia, we got a lot of uh, what you call a top response, violence response some, in some part of Indonesia because stereotypically and also culturally, women cannot become the head of the family. But from along the way, then through the process. Uh, the, the movement and where women doing things at the ground, take leadership and also doing a good things which affect the whole community, then it's uh, accepted. So I just want to, to show how actually 
uh, doing it and practicing it in the, our daily life can normalize things which consider as as what to call against the norm uh, before. Um, so I agree with what Elsa says that, uh, you know, the, the, the stereotyping, uh, when, what is it? Oh, God, I know I lost my, my thinkings on that. Um, okay, you can just, just to underline the uh, the normalized uh, practicing from the, yes, yes, uh, adult is very important, but I think for from the beginning, because it's, it's, it's much more challenging to change the way adult thinks because it's already there. Right? Very, very patriarchy is really embedded in our thinkings, but it's much more easier to teach the children from their, the young. So where they're still very young with uh, the more equal, more justice or a division of uh, labor or uh, power relation and those kind of things. That's why I think it's the parents, not only, I'm not talking about only fathers, but also mothers, parents as mother and fathers together have, have this responsibility. So family change makers or, or everybody change makers. Great, thank you. Um, Natalie or Sandy, would you like to come in on this? On these questions, um, does Professor Sandy want to go ahead, or please you go first and I'll follow? Okay, thank you, Professor. Um, yeah, I at at the center, one of the things we do is training. So it's part of our work, really, to do consciousness raising on on gender issues. So I personally do a lot of gender sensitivity training because that's part of our work is to educate and you know really about patriarchy and unequal gender relations etc and i find that it on a cognitive level it's not difficult to sell the concept of equality and i'll also mention before that i always always include um, a soji esque component in all our gender training so we don't just talk about women and men we also include issues of sexual orientation gender identity and expression and also sex characteristics but anyway um to continue um i i think that to change attitudes and behavior it's not enough to target just the cognitive uh, and cognitive understanding but what we really should be trying to do is to touch the heart in other words to to um target the effective. And I love this quotation from Martha Nosbaum, who's an American feminist philosopher, who said that in order to change the heart, we must tell a story. So that's what I do. Because I, I on, on one level, I attack the cognitive aspect on, and I always end with stories, hoping that it will arouse compassion and empathy. At least, I mean, at least I hope to have planted a seed, you know, to make them think. I don't expect that they'll change their behavior overnight. But I think we need to understand how unequal gender relations or all systems of oppression actually are harmful to people. I don't know if people understand that enough. And it was mentioned earlier, I think, in the chat. And I, that's part of my recommendations. We should always consider also an intersectional approach when we look at issues. So it's not just gender, because gender is not a standalone issue. It always intersects with other systems of oppression. So that's me. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Sandy, can I bring you in? Thank sure. You. And just building on from what Natalie said about um, telling stories, coming from a tribal community where uh, historically and traditionally we did have balance and we did have roles and everybody making a contribution to keep the collective well. So we go back to some of those stories in terms of uh, capturing the, our traditional tribal stories, our examples of where women were the fierce um, champions who fought hard for their families, both spiritually as well as physically and bringing back some of our values and ensuring that our values are well understood, that this was never our way traditionally. And when we go into our houses of learning, which are very specific places that require certain rituals to be undertaken, then that can impact on those, on the effective. So we find those very, very powerful mediums to return to the culture. So that's just one thing that, um, 
we are fortunate to have both our places of learning through our own mediums and our own language, building on our own tribal philosophy. Um, I also just wonder about media and in particular um, social media and technology and always wonder how we can use that more effectively because when I ask people in my space is where they're getting their messages from, it's generally from media and you know there's a responsibility to also put the media through gender sensitive programs as well hopefully they're willing to be able to to do that but certainly so many uh so much positive messaging can be brought forth through using the media wisely and using social media wisely as well great thank you and i'm going to um give the final word um back to Kyoko. Um, one of the questions that's also just come up, which is really at the heart of this conversation as well, I think is, you know, what's the place of legislation in, in changing gender norms? And, you know, I, I think we're really touching on the fact that as panelists are saying, legislation is, is important, but it, it, we have to go beyond legislation. But Kyoko, I would appreciate your thoughts on, on that and, and, and final remarks you would like to make. Um, uh, I think uh, it's very important that we change the, the, the everyday practices. For example, when the COVID-19 uh, uh, um, uh, uh, allowances were distributed, it was distributed to household, to the head of household. That is a no-no, yeah? It's, it's, we have to make it sure, make sure that it goes to the individual. We do not, yeah, so that's the one way that you actually change the way we have a, a mindset that head of household, the whole patriarchal system that we have. Or like, uh, uh, like care work, like we have, like if care work, we, th we think care work is so important. And then that kind of concept have to be reflected in, for example, much higher minimum wage or much better working condition, or like care work workers are not taxed, for example. And so this kind of, the whole concept of it have to be translated to actual practices and system in the government and in the, uh, in the companies. Great, thank you very much. So we're now moving on and I feel like we could all talk for, for several hours about these critically important issues. We're now gonna move on to the, to the question of recommendations and, and um, what should UNESCO do? And we've already had several ideas um, from all of you on the panel, which are fantastic around um, kind of you are thinking on what, what should a UNESCO address? And just a reminder to everybody listening, please post your ideas um, in the chat box now around what do you think UNESCO should take forward as part of this new um, flagship program. Clearly UNESCO um, can't address everything, um, but it does have the power of, it, of its organization and its many friends and allies um, around the world and its fantastic staff to be able to um, address this issue. So I'd like to return to anybody on the panel who would like to give their recommendation to UNESCO as part of this new flagship program What's the one or two things that you um, would recommend um, that the organization does? Um, and um, you know, you, you, I know the number of you have already flagged some things which, which we've noted, so feel free to reinforce those or to choose um, uh, new things. Sandy, should we start with you? Um... Sure. And so just a, a couple of things. So in New Zealand, we're, um, we're not in lockdown we're free to move around. Uh, we're at level one. And so a lot of our discussion is about the rebuild, uh, but there doesn't seem to be a gender sensitive approach to the rebuild of the economy. There has been an approach called the pick and shovel projects, where immediately you see a male figure, right? The pick and shovel projects. And so having a gender sensitive approach to recovery I think is really important. I don't think we have enough disaggregated data on particular um, Māori and Pacific women in New Zealand and so you know data and, um, and research I think to back up some of the community initiatives, support for the NGOs who are doing the work and um, Obviously, decision making and from from 
my account is having Indigenous representation and Indigenous women representation on these decision-making bodies is incredibly important. So those are just a few ideas I think that can be supported through UNESCO recommendations. Great, thank you. Natalie, can I bring you in next, please? Yes, thank you. Um, okay, well, my recommendation really centers around the need to, and in, this is in all caps, educate, educate, educate. So we must really persist in the work of doing critical consciousness raising about hierarchical gender relations, discrimination and violence against women and how this is rooted in patriarchal beliefs and attitudes. We should also come up with novel approaches which target not only, like I mentioned earlier, the cognitive but the effective. And then we should integrate critical perspectives on men and masculinities such as hegemonic and harmful masculinities in the discussion of gender stereotypes and include men in the conversations. Also, and lastly, we should use intersectional perspectives because people have other social identities that intersect in ways that affect how they are viewed, treated, and understood. So it's not really just about gender. There are other systems of oppression which also produce and reproduce stereotypes such as class, ethnicity, race, religion, disability, sexual orientation, et cetera. So, and these systems interact and reinforce each other. So they don't exist independently of each other. And we should remember that social justice demands transformative action towards the equalization of all asymmetrical power relations across interlocking and intersecting systems of oppression and domination. So it's more in terms of approach, I think, that my recommendations are just I hopefully will your the work of UNESCO will be informed by these approaches. Thank you. Great, thank you. Nani, could I come to you next? Yeah. Uh, I have I think I agree with support all the the um, recommendation, but I want to highlight two things. First, uh, to I think to have some what program of focus to reduce digital divide by bridging the technology gap to ensuring uh, equal access to technology and digital platform by women and girls because we experienced during this COVID how you know, women and girls left behind because of this. And also include providing women and girls with relevant education and support intervention they need to build their capacities and increase their confidence in utilizing digital tools and platform. And the second, I want to support the idea of supporting and generation, uh, generation of data and information on gender-based violence improve local uh, and country reporting system, work with CSO and local partners to capture gender and gender-based violence specific data from the ground that can in, inform gender responsive intervention programs and financing from the states, from the, the UN and from all uh, the stakeholders. And lastly, I think to really uh, support women's, women's leadership and decision-making, uh, especially in the workplace where in the trade union, for example, um, in the workplace where the women dominated sectors and women's leadership and in, in decision-making process and also uh, support women call. Yeah. Great, so, so I, the last point with that wasn't very, didn't support women corps, did you say? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, that's part of the uh, strengthening women's leadership and decision-making in this work set sector. There are now, there is strong movement of women to develop their, or their cooperation, their co-op to become more, more what you call it, uh, more sustainable in their livelihoods. So to support this, uh, this specific action movement that, that lead by women in our region, particularly in terms of economic empowerment. Great, thank you. Kyoko, can I bring you in next, please? Yeah. Uh, so I think um, uh, very important recommendations have already been um, made. So I just um, add on to whatever is, it might not be yet 
said. Uh, one is about uh, about care work. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, UNESCO brings out uh, more, uh, more and more kind of stories, as Natalie was also saying, stories about care work, so that we also change the, the way people see care work. Care work is work and the most important work in the whole world. So, so that kind of mindset also can be changed that have, by having more and more stories and then uh, uh, for, uh, from UNESCO. Another thing is about uh, uh, what also Elsa was saying about different ways of doing things, like how like child care or care work can be done differently. Yeah, so so those are so this kind of uh, it doesn't have to be done by wom uh, by woman. It doesn't have to be done by the household. So that family. So so this kind of different ways of doing things have to be uh, much more talked about uh, or like career development for factory workers. I mean this kind of different ways of thinking and doing and looking at the future is something that UNESCO might, will be very good in projecting to to everybody. So that's uh, one, one thing. Another thing is uh, more uh, more studies uh, or highlighting the old women's uh, uh, issues. I think uh, in the chat they were also talking about disabled women, but and then so so the the poverty among this hidden group of women is something that again UNESCO might also try to bring it out. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, also Marie. So. Coming back to legislation, not every country has legislation to address violence against women and girls. So make sure your member countries do have it. Education, because um, clearly it's not part of the curriculum and therefore, you know, people don't know about uh, gender norms and they perpetuate these, stereo these harmful practices and stereotypes. And it should be top down as well as bottom up because you have politicians who... Uh, say, highly sexist and misogynistic statements that then fuel their uh, followers to also, uh, you know, follow in their footsteps. And the last is disaggregated data, which can be used. So platforms like Safe City, if that can be supported to collect uh, anonymous reports or even, um, you know, closed system reporting, uh, which will help uh, survivors to come forward and share their stories without a backlash and without being judged. So those are my recommendations. Thank Great, thank you very much. Um, and Ashwin, can I bring you in on this? Question? Sure, yeah. So I think three, three different things that I'd point out. Uh, one is just being able to amplify uh, what works and what doesn't in the kind of space of gender-based violence, uh, male engagement, et cetera, and being able to mobilize much more, much more resources towards that. And UNESCO can play that role both in at a country context, but also cross-culturally, uh, that'd be one. I think number two is engaging institutions that really dominate our life, uh, Amazon, Facebook, Instagram, uh, the governments, and being able to push them to do more uh, on gender equality, pushing Instagram to have much better policies, much better tools for women influencers, women engaging on Instagram. It's, I think we are men run the risk of narrowing the space that women have in these areas just by the way we engage. And I think that trend needs to be pushed back against. Uh, and finally, I think just innovation in uh, gender equality, especially when we all kind of get embedded with technology more and more. One of the things that shocks me is uh, we have more R&D spend on office table chairs than on gender-based violence. And I think that that has to change radically and being able to, uh, UNESCO being able to bring uh, kind of the best in class expertise around how can we make tech better uh, for women? How can we make it a much, it, the use case is much better for everyone involved, uh, I think is going to be hugely powerful going forward. So being able to embed these kind of pockets of places where this kind of innovation is happening, happening and is being disseminated at scale would be helpful. Fantastic. And I think your example is a really kind of fantastic visualization of just how far behind we are globally in our prioritization of gender-based violence. Um, it's a great pleasure now to, um, to give the floor to Ashwarya Segal, who is the Associate Program Coordinator within the Social and Human Sciences Unit um, with, within the UNESCO office in New Delhi. And the floor is yours, Ashwarya, Ashwarya sorry. Um, love your thoughts um, from the UNESCO perspective on the conversation that you've heard before we move to close. 
Thank you. Uh, depending on the time zone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody tuned in. Thank you to the panelists for that extremely stimulating discussion. And I also wish to thank the organizers for allowing me to share this space with leading voices in the field. As you all know, gender-based violence is one of the most common and widespread human rights abuses in the world. And I'm here to illuminate UNESCO's role in countering stereotypes that perpetuate gender-based discrimination. Asia is a region with vast landscape, diverse cultures, and large populations, thereby making change a difficult process to initiate. What many people only read in reports is the lived reality for many girls and women in South Asia. We are each facing gender stereotypes of our own. And since gender-based violence resides on a spectrum, UNESCO's aim is to combat all versions of it by tackling women's disempowerment at its root. The most effective way to do that, as the panelists said, is through education. As UNESCO believes, and I reiterate, gender equality must be addressed in and through education. More than anything, education determines who thrives. It can be leveraged as a tool for changing attitudes that help people accept gender equality as a fundamental social value whilst empowering girls and women. To this end, as part of the COVID-19 response, UNESCO initiated a program called Action for Equality in line with the global efforts to achieve the sustainable development goals focused on gender equality and quality education for all. Through this program, we have so far trained more than 130 educators and 6,000 students from over 150 schools across India. At the core of this initiative is a community-based behavioral change program designed to provide, provide young boys with the skills and knowledge they need to challenge existing gender stereotypes and take action to end violence and discrimination against girls and women. In addition, we all know, uh, we, we, we know all too well the power and rage of, uh, rage of an anecdotes and storytelling and how they can bring about change. To capitalize on this, UNESCO is creating more space for dialogue and providing an open mic for stories and struggles of different women to be heard. As evidence suggests, COVID-19 has exacerbated the challenges that women face. The reported surge in domestic violence and cyber crimes has made girls and women more vulnerable as they struggle to fight another pandemic within their homes and also online. Therefore, to advance global action on SDG 5 on gender equality, against the background of the pandemic, UNESCO supported the release of a short film called Listen to Her with Indian actor and director Nandita Das in the lead, which is also available on YouTube for those interested to watch. The film touches upon two important issues that women are facing uh, currently, the increase of workload and the rise in domestic violence. The idea is to broach the obvious and subtle forms of stereotyping that women face in their daily lives and bring the issue to the fore through the powerful me uh, medium of cinema. As a supplement to mass media, our local civil, so civil society partners are instrumental in helping to percolate our messages to the farthest corners and bringing voices from the margins to the mainstream. A great example of such a collaboration is the soon to be launched scoping report on transforming mentalities and a regional research on masculinities being launched in collaboration with the Asia Foundation to operationalize male privilege in Asia. Through these reports, UNESCO New Delhi seeks to clarify an emerging consensus on the importance of working with men and boys from all walks of life to change the prevailing inequitable gender norms and stereotypes and develop some shared perspectives on the way forward. It is clear that to sustain social change towards gender equality, collective action is key. And the onus shouldn't just be on women to question the boxes that society puts us in. If men are a part of the problem, it is their duty to also find solutions. And as UNESCO, we help seek these solutions collectively. Thank you. Ashwara, thank you very much indeed. Well, we've now come to the end of our fantastic and really rich conversation. I want to start by thanking the panel for their wonderful contributions. A virtual round of applause to, to all of you. Thank you very much indeed. That was um, super. And I'm sorry that there's so many areas that we could have discussed and talked about, but in the limited time that we have, um, we didn't get through everything. Um, 
you'll be aware, um, you may have seen in the chat already that information has been posted about the forthcoming webinars um, in the other regions. Please do share those. Please share with your colleagues. And there'll also be um, a link put in the chat um, for a feedback form, which we would appreciate if you could complete those of you who are listening online so that we can get your, your input on the event, but also to keep in touch. And just a reminder that we will take everything away, the fantastic recommendations and thoughts from the panelists, all of the input on the chat and use it as part of um, this new initiative. I just wanna end by emphasizing you know, one point. I, I think we began the conversation really by saying the world has moved forward on legislation around gender equality and women's rights, but legislation is not enough. The, um, the World Economic Forum, as you know, said that it will take over a hundred years um, for gender equality um, between the sexes. And you know, I don't think any of us on this call have got a hundred years to wait. So I, I really think centering the need to shift mindsets to shift social norms really to address patriarchy to reimagine gender roles but also to celebrate the things that are often seen as weak and, and, and feminine as, as has been said I think it would be a fantastic advancement um, in this cause for a better world and I just want to leave you um, with the words of Mahatma Gandhi um, as you know from from this region who said in a gentle way you can shake the world and so I hope all of us, we go forward, let's continue to shake the world and make this world a better place. Um, so thank you very much for everything you do. Thanks again for joining us. Keep in touch and thanks once again to our fantastic panelists and to UNESCO and all the staff for the great efforts and work that they do. Stay tuned and um, keep in touch. Thank you. <laughs>